We're here in Botswana, a country that's so well known for its incredible wildlife. But that wildlife can also be an incredible burden and danger to our Global Mission Pioneer. We're here in the village of Satau. Welcome to Global Mission Snapshots. Just before he went up to heaven, Jesus gave us a command. He gave us a mission. Jesus said, go, go unto all the world, telling them of his love. This is our mission. This is our global mission. Hello and welcome to Global Mission Snapshots. I'm Gary Krauss. Over the years, printing and Christian literature have helped carry the good news to new areas of the world. In the age of satellite television and the internet, printed materials are still helping carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today we'll be talking with Ty Gibson from Lightbearers Ministry about their mission and outreach, which involves printing literature and a whole lot more. We'll also talk with Nancy Kite about global mission in Botswana, and we'll visit Malawi Adventist University to find out how one student's life was changed forever by Adventist education. But first, let's learn more about Light Bearers Ministry. There are people who are struggling in life. People are living under poverty. They cannot find food. And this poverty is leading most of the young people to commit crimes. Poverty comes with suffering, lack of peace, crime, drugs, HIV, AIDS. But it's unfortunate we don't have enough resources to help them. Because of the poverty area, we cannot manage to buy the literature. There are people that really want this literature and we haven't got much to give them. They want more and more and more. We have more orders than we can possibly keep up with. The needs never diminish. We could literally run two ships and still not meet all the requests that we have from around the world. There are many people who are still unreached of whom Jesus died for. Lightbearer's ministry began with an overwhelming conviction that we needed to impact people all over the world. When we go back to the beginning of this ministry, we realize that God began all of this focus with two young men who just wanted to preach and teach. We began giving Bible studies together, doing small group studies by invitation in, in homes. And that developed into calls to go and preach and share in different churches. People began to request tracks and study guides of what we were preaching and teaching. We began creating little publications on our, our new Macintosh computers. We bought a copy machine, just a photocopy machine and a stapler, and we began making little booklets. At the same time, we were receiving requests from Africa for literature. It was then that this idea came that we were to become publishers. We didn't know anything about publishing. And so we stepped out by faith. Everything we did was by faith. We bought our first press, got some paper, got some ink, got the chemicals. We said, wow, is there a manual with this thing? Ty and I were just working on that thing and trying to figure it all out. We just tried to get ink to stick to paper. And we printed. It wasn't real readable. It wasn't beautiful. We were up all night long. But we knew we could make it work, and we knew for sure that we needed to hire somebody else to run the press. Within a matter of three months, people began requesting more and more of this literature and saying, hey, you know, people really need this information everywhere. And that just continued to develop until another person and another person heard about it and they said, let's build a publishing house and let's get you some new equipment. 
We got additional presses, better presses, faster presses, folding equipment, bindery equipment. We began targeting areas around the world with uh, gospel literature. We believe that God was helping us understand an important principle, and that is freely you've received, freely give. We had orders from Tanzania, Zambia, Nicaragua, Peru, Mexico, Honduras, Romania, Bulgaria. And so we're sending tracks over there and people are receiving the gospel for the first time and they're writing us back. All over the world people were realizing that something incredible had just been raised into existence. Lightbearer's ministry is primarily all about publishing, so let's just take a tour of our 15,000 square foot publishing facility. We're able to produce multiplied millions of publications in 32 different languages that go all over the world. The great thing about this press is that it is completely computerized. The press is able to print on both sides of the paper in one pass through the press, roll after roll after roll all day long. Once the material is printed, folded, boxed, and palletized, it goes into this large storage unit that's like a big drawer system. This is where it gets really exciting because once the material is completely prepared, we load this stuff up into semi-loads that hold between two and three million publications and that material goes out to Seattle where it's loaded onto a barge and then taken somewhere in the world. That stuff lands and these people are overwhelmed. They have reading material in their own mother tongue. That's when people's hearts really begin to get touched as they encounter the gospel of Christ and God's incredible love for them, many of them for the first time in their lives. Paper is powerful. Paper is something that we see utilized in a way that goes beyond anything that is in the world today. It has a power that no other medium in the world has because it has an ongoing life. One person in the home reads that piece of literature. And then they can give it to someone else, and they can read it and share it, and then they can give it to somebody else. And next time, you've got two people instead of one. It's actually passed on, even from one family member to another to read. And next time, you've got three instead of two. Unlike radio and television, that comes and then is gone, that track is a permanent possession of that individual. And so you see one piece of literature after another, a nickel or less, going to these individuals and being used over and over again, reaching one heart after another after another. It's my pleasure to welcome Ty Gibson, co-director of Light Bearers, to our program. Ty, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Gary. Now, what got you involved in ministry? You know, I've been doing ministry, actually, with light bearers since I was 19. So I've done it for my entire adult life. We, for like 20 years now. Yeah, or more. <laughs> Let's not say more. <laughs> yes. What happened, Gary, is uh, I was raised in a secular home yeah. and uh, came to the Lord when I was 18. My wife Sue and I were baptized together as teenagers when we were 18 years old. And then uh, James Rafferty, whom some may know as, as uh, my partner in ministry, he also became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, uh, I think about a year after we were baptized. He and I became friends, and uh, we just started doing Bible studies, sharing with, with people in the local area, doing Bible studies, small group Bible studies in homes. People started recording those Bible studies, and then after recording them, sharing them, and we got more invitations coming. We thought, that's strange. You know, religion in general was strange to us, but the idea of taking appointments was not something we had thought of. Next thing you know, we were doing seminars uh, every weekend, and then uh, and we've been doing it ever since. So we just preach the gospel wherever we're called. That's fantastic because I mean we believe in the priesthood of all believers, mm -hmm. and so you as two young men mm -hmm. said we are called to be ministers. Now, light bearers, I mean you you're involved in writing books, in television ministry, public evangelism. You print you know, thousands of pages of mm -hmm. free literature going on around the world. You have digma.com with videos. I mean, 
you, this is a very comprehensive ministry. It is. We, we're basically, we're communicators. We're, we're in the spiritual business of conveying the truths of God's character and love to the world. And so we use whatever communication means are at our disposal. While the ministry began as a teaching and preaching ministry shortly after our, our conversion to Christ, um, we immediately saw the power of printed materials. Mm -hmm. So we began uh, making our sermons into little outlines and people wanted more and more of them until we found ourselves in need of a press. <laughs> so we, we bought our first press and next thing you know, we were getting requests for this material by the thousands. So we bought a bigger press and then a bigger one and uh, we were very, very shortly after starting the ministry, we were filling entire containers like those semi containers you see mm -hmm. traveling on the on the highway on uh, behind 18 wheelers we fill containers Gary with about 3 million publications per container wow. in multiple different languages and then we send that container by truck to the ocean and then by barge to wherever the uh, country is of choice and we send out multiple containers like that a year we send out probably about 40 to 50 million pieces of literature free of charge to the mission field every year and so that's the publishing aspect of what we do uh, the video work of course is digma.com and, and then other video projects that we do digma.com is just the most recent one again it's a it's it's to us it's just a tool it's a communication medium mm -hmm. people are out there who read so we publish people are out there who watch so we produce video people are out there who listen so we produce audio we're just trying by every means possible to communicate the gospel uh, as fast and as far as possible. So how are you supported? Lightbearers is a nonprofit corporation, mm -hmm. so we're supported by people who see value in the work that we're doing. And uh, it's, a, it, it's just a ministry that's supported by friends, people who, who say, yeah, we want to get behind that and, and make it successful and make that happen so they can reach more people. And uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a supported ministry in that sense. So uh, to find out more information, they can go to your website, which is? Lightbearers.org would be where it's at. Can I mention one other aspect of the ministry? Go ahead. This is really important, Gary. Okay. okay. I'm listening. Because in addition to the publishing, in addition to the video work, in addition to teaching and preaching and evangelism, um, about a year ago, year and a half ago now, um, there is something exciting that happened. An, a ministry called Arise, which was headed up by David Ashrick, has now become a part of Lightbearers, and we, we do a discipleship program where we train and teach uh, 45 to 50 young people each year. They come and live with us, actually. Wow. So people may want to check that out as well. Fantastic. In 30 seconds, tell me of somebody whose life has been changed through life, Light Bearers. When, when we were in Zambia not long ago, we met this young lady who was um, going to a doctor's appointment because she had a growth and she thought she had cancer and was going to die. She was just in her 20s. And uh, somebody had left some of our literature on public transportation. She looked down. She was scared to death she was going to lose her life. She was just really upset. And she saw this piece of literature there, Gary. When I met her, she was telling me excitedly, she looked down, the title of the piece of literature uh, captured her attention. She started reading. Two days later, after she had her doctor's appointment, somebody who shares the entire set of Bible lessons from which that was won, walks into her place of business and says, we're signing people up for Bible studies in the area. Would you like to sign up? He showed her those studies wow. and she said, that's the very, I have one of those. She signed up, she, she was baptized uh, uh, just a few months later after going through the Bible study course and and she's a precious sister. We had the chance to meet her and to hear her story firsthand. Fantastic. Ty, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Our viewers at home, I wish we had more time to listen to stories from Ty of how God is blessing their ministry, leading men and women, boys and girls, to know Jesus Christ and to reveal a God who loves them so much. Remember, you can go to lightbearers.org and don't forget to go to digma.com to see some of the cutting edge videos that are aimed to reach non-believers. Please pray for Ty and the other part, partners in Lightbearer's ministry. A major area of emphasis for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Southern Africa-India Ocean Division is education. 
In 2006, the 13th Sabbath Offering went to help build education centers in Mozambique and Malawi. At Lakeview College in Malawi, a new dormitory is finishing the final stages of construction. Your offerings have helped to provide much needed housing for Adventist young people in this rapidly growing country. Malawi has more than 290,000 members and educating its young people is vital to its continued growth. One student whose life has been changed is Justin Luemba. Justin was born in Malawi but moved to the United States when he was young. He quickly started getting into trouble. I was into drugs, alcohol, women. I was a basketball player, so it comes with a lot of, I guess, distractions as well. Um, so coming here, that changed significantly because the environment is, is that of such where there's a spiritual atmosphere. Justin quickly found that this new atmosphere was making a profound change on his life. His new spiritual environment was moving his life in a new direction. Today, Justin is a fourth-year business major, and he feels that the school's holistic approach to education is a huge benefit to the church in Malawi. You have youth who are going out there in their disciplines, but with Christ as well. So that, and we, we're, we're told in the end times, it's the youth that are, that are the ones who are going to be uh, spreading the gospel and hastening the, the, the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Your faithful support of a 13th Sabbath offering goes to help change the lives of people all over the world. One way is by helping to train and educate young people who can then affect the lives of the people they come in contact with every day. The young people of Malawi will be able to serve their part of the world because of the sacrifices that the World Church has made. Next up, we travel from Malawi to another African country, Botswana. And my guest is Nancy Kite, who is the marketing director for Adventist Mission. Nancy, you had me intrigued at the opener where you mentioned the wild animals and the threat to pioneers. Tell us about that. Well, most of us don't think about the fact that animals have the right of way in certain areas. And this is definitely the fact in northern Botswana where we were visiting. Um, the main highway goes right through a natural reserve park and hundreds of thousands of elephants just walk back and forth as they're migrating. So it's a kind of life that we can't even imagine. Mm. So the elephants are dangerous? Uh, they actually are dangerous. They are if not. If they step on you? Or? <laughs> actually, they create a lot of damage to property. Uh. You know, people have to support themselves, but with their gardens, an elephant will come through during the day or night and slash its way through. But it's not just the elephants. There are a lot of other wild animals, too, that make it dangerous. So, you know, we at our desk might think, oh, maybe it would be helpful if, if I sent money to buy a bicycle for this pioneer. But in certain areas, a person on a bicycle can't get away from a wild animal fast enough. So we need to send an armored vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is one of the issues that our pioneer, wow. Pastor Kebe, faces. He has to take public transport, or else he's got to walk very quickly and very observantly <laughs> very to get to his next place. I'd be walking very quickly too. Yes. So we see global mission pioneers facing different challenges in different parts of the world, but yeah, I guess that's a fact of life. I never would have thought of it if I hadn't met him and talked to him myself. Now you visited two places in Botswana. The first place was? It was in the village of Satao where Pastor Kebe settled and he goes in every morning and has a worship with a local clinic, um, prays with the staff and with the patients that are there. He has established a relationship with a village chief. So he's doing all the proper um, traditional accepted things that are our protocol in that area. Mm. And so he's becoming one of the community uh, very quickly. Now, has he established an, a new group of believers there yet? He has. He has a small uh, group. They meet at a, at a school nearby, but they don't have a structure of their own yet. Ah. Now, so, so his very first steps in church planting were to go and make friends with the, or, or the protocol with the leaders. Exactly. Sometimes it's called the head man. Okay. Now, the second place that you visited was... That was in the village of Soje, and that was in the southern part of Botswana. Okay. And it was interesting to see that church because um, on this particular Sabbath, the 
new pastor was the third global mission pioneer into that area. Mm. So a few years back, the first pioneer went and started uh, getting acquainted with the neighbors. And again, as protocol, got acquainted with the head man, established a relationship there. And as people became more interested in studying with him, their group began to grow, a second pioneer came along, and then funds from the um, 13th Sabbath mission offering helped to build the church that is there now. And it's a lovely church. It's bright, it's white. Um, the parking lot is just all dirt, but somebody comes along on Friday and rakes a nice design into it, and it's all ready for Sabbath the next day. Now you said parking lot. For some reason I was imagining that people would be walking to church, but th th this is like an urban? Well, actually, we thought that there would be a lot of cars, but there were only two cars, one bicycle, and everyone else had walked. Okay. So I think they're probably planning for the future. Now, Botswana historically has been quite a bright spot in Africa for its democracy. Um, how did you find the people there? I found the people to be extremely friendly, very welcoming, very open, um, very interested, and in most most occasions, language wasn't a problem. But when we didn't speak Setswana, or if a person didn't speak English, we could communicate quite easily. You know, you you uh, make a fuss over their children, and mm. and they're very proud. Or if it seems right, then you hold one of their children and pick them up. It's just very very friendly. It felt very safe there. Mm. So, what are the major mission challenges that they face in Botswana? I think probably the major mission challenges would be um, secularism, even there. Um, they said, when we talked to them, they said most people weren't all that interested in church. They were interested in getting ahead, uh, especially if they had uh, ra been raised in a poor village. They wanted to do well and be able to support their parents and relatives in style. So they say that their biggest challenge is the young people wanting to go out, earn more money, and they're very interested in comfort and um, some sorts of symbols that show that they have achieved something. Right. Now the global mission pioneers that you met, they're living a sacrificial life. Yes. Could you describe how they're living? Yes. Um, the first pioneer that we met lived in just one room. Oh. It was in a fourplex, uh, one room, no electricity. He has to cook his uh, meal on a little open fire. Um, there isn't even a bathroom in his facility, but there's a shared one. So there's like a communal mm -hmm. bathroom outside in, a, in another enclosure. But that's the way everyone else is living, and, and that's how he does his living as well. Well, you know, we, we see Global Mission Pioneers just receiving a small living stipend, but they're doing it for the love of God. Nancy, Thank thanks you. so much for joining us. My Appreciate pleasure. It. Viewers at home, please remember Global Mission Pioneers in your prayers. Global Mission Pioneers face many challenges, but they're doing it because God has touched their lives and they want to touch other lives for Him. To my gentle searching eyes There have been no disguises Nothing that you done that you can hide I've seen you in your darkest sin and know the pain and guilt within know the question on your mind am I worth saving anyway I see you child for who you are know that sin has left its ugly scars but I know you were meant to be And my love will set you free So come weary child Rest beside me for a while I know your care The burdens that you
Well, if you enjoyed those images of mission, you'll love the new Adventist mission calendar. This beautiful calendar will keep the faces and places of mission in front of you every day. So if you live in North America, please accept this free gift as our thanks for your continuing prayers and support. Just call toll free 1-800-648-5824. Or you can visit our website and just ask for the Adventist mission calendar or offer 305. And don't forget to mention the calendar or offer 305. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. Thank you again for your continuing support of Adventist Mission through your prayers, personal involvement, and your finances. For Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krause, and I hope you can join me next time right here on Global Mission Snapshots. <laughs>